Welcome to another episode of Tandas on Keka, and with me here today is Evarita Kamau and Grace Kinuthia, a psychologist. And today we are going to be tackling the, <laughs> the elephant in the African room, which is black tax. And we're also going to be looking at generational trauma and what that looks like in terms of things like the superwoman syndrome and parentification and what those actually mean for firstborn daughters in African families. And we're going to try and tackle <laughs> some of the challenges, challenges and opportunities. Yes. I'm yeah. assuming they're going to be opportunities, opportunities as well, as well. Yeah. Um, so that we can, you know, just just hear what that looks like. And Everita is here to represent African, African an African and firstborn, firstborn daughter. daughter. <laughs> and Grace is here to just basically give us answer those hard questions around what generational trauma looks like and do you know what a superwoman syndrome is and if if that's what that looks like can you let us know if if it's an actual thing Emma, we just hear these things on All from right. our tiktok mm. therapists okay. which i i i always say i refer to so i'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself so that the people who are listening can hear and understand where you're from and why you're here so do you want she can go, can go first. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, okay. firstborn daughter. Let's go. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, my name is Ivari Takama. Um, and like you said, I'm the first I'm a firstborn daughter. Uh, I'm a firstborn daughter of five. Um, and sometimes I'm called a deputy mom in our family. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, my name is Chris Kenothia. I'm a psychologist by profession. Yeah, I'm also a firstborn. I'm very You're also oh, a firstborn. No, first, yeah. oh, nice. Firstborn African daughter. daughter yeah. Yes. Of, <laughs> the parent of three. <laughs> of three, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is that so before we even start with the questions, um my first question usually is are you a firstborn like how many how many kids are you in your family? Uh five. five. So I'm a firstborn of five. So is there an age gap between, what's the age gap between you Still and the last born? Me and the last born is um, 14 years, I think, ah, or 15. So actually no, wait, 16. Man. Something yeah. like 16 years, yeah. yeah deputy man, because he, he, sometimes he feels like my first born. Yeah, because um, 16 feels... Six, by the yeah, time he was born, it was basically my child, technically. Yeah, because yeah. you're... In high school in, at that yeah, time? Yeah, I was in high school. I yeah. was in high school yeah, at that point. What about you? Uh, first one of three. Mm -hmm. I include myself in the... Because mm -hmm. I'm also parenting yeah. myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but literally I have a sister and a brother. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's the age gap? My... Uh, it would be seven plus two because then they're so close. So mm -hmm. last one is a bit... Nine, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So um, before we even start talking mm -hmm. about black tax, I, I know you're, I know you're yeah. smiling. <laughs> Um, the one of the questions we we had in terms of what what firstborn this this firstborn issue that I've been I've been hearing about um, I'm not going to say experiencing but hearing about because I'm also a firstborn mm. and one of the things that I have been seeing in terms of how Af let me stop saying African just gener generationally. Mm -hmm. Um, our parents parented us as firstborn, yes. were their first kids, mm -hmm. but there's such a big distinction. And tell me if this is mm -hmm. true in your families, mm -hmm. both of you. There's such a big distinction between how your parents parented you as a firstborn and the lastborn. That's why I was asking about yeah, the, 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 gap. the gap in between. Mm -hmm. So do you think, have you experienced that? Um, I would say yes. There's definitely a world of a difference between how I was parented and how um, the baby in the family was parented. Mm. Um, for me, it was rules, 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 rules. And then by the time the last one came, it was a whole... In fact, even with the, with my siblings, mm. it was a whole different world. Um, I keep laughing uh, because for me, going out was a taboo completely. Those, you were not going anywhere. Explain to the listeners what going, going out, out means. as in even to go out to a club. Uh, it was taboo. It was unheard of. It was you were never gonna do this. Mm. Then my siblings come along, and one day we, I think I'd even moved out of house, out of home, and they were talking and they're telling me how my dad 
dropped them carnival to go and watch wow. Papa Wemba. Wow. I was like, what do you mean? How is that even a possibility? What, what world are you guys living in? Because yeah. I'm like, I, the same father mm. or a different one. Mm. But it was that much of a difference. Like mm. I couldn't go out, but by the time my siblings were getting there, my dad was picking them up from clubs. I'm like, I, you know, something, there's, you know, there's, something is not adding up. Yeah. Yeah. And this time you're living by yourself. This time I'm living you're by myself. You're just coming to home, like you're coming home yeah, to visit. To visit. My and was there? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? What happened to my parents? Whose parents? Yeah. Who, are, who, who are these people you people are calling parents? Because I'm like, that could never happen. Yeah. I was beaten blue black because I thought I could sneak out and go to a club. Then same parents are coming to pick you up from the club. Exactly. Was let's, there talk, night. let's talk about that actually mm. because the beatings that we received when we were kids hey. let's mm -hmm. do you have kids as well yes right? I do. you have i have two two yes so how are your parents with your kids <laughs> i was almost beaten once by my father <laughs> because i beat my daughter it was like what what do you mean you yeah. can't beat her so i'm looking at him like what do you mean i can't i'm punishing her mm. I, i'm trying to teach her lesson i was like please not my grandchildren not my grandchildren what do you why do you think that happens Considering I'm a parent too, I can <laughs> say whatever she was talking about. And at times I'm thinking, oh my God, these people just think. Mm -hmm. But maybe to be, just to give a perspective of personal experience, mine was the other way around. Mm -hmm. I was given permission to go out. My, our last one was never, yeah. ever, 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 oh. like, don't step oh. out. Mm -hmm. So I think for her, she used to be like, what do you mean? Who is she? Like mm -hmm. the last weekend, you know, do yeah. the whole thing. But I think mostly I like to consider first ones as the experimental parents, uh, like kids, yeah. you know, Parenting doesn't have a manual, so these people are new to this whole mm -hmm. thing. And maybe hardly are first ones like in some if you ask the elder parents, they'll ask you, How did you get married? I realized I was pregnant, so I had to marry you. You know, single mm -hmm. parenting was a taboo. Mm -hmm. So you find that in most scenarios, the first ones come with a lot of trauma. Because mm -hmm. maybe some parents are also angry. Mm -hmm. Even when you've been beaten up, you're not being beaten up because it's you, 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 you. Mm -hmm. In some scenarios, you've had like you're still mad because if it was not for you, the first one, I wouldn't have ended up in this marriage. Yeah. If it's not for you, the first one, maybe I would have had a way out. So you find that times parents have their own baggage. Then also parents are parenting us the way they were parented. True. So Backed. for them, they grew up knowing the only way to be straight like us, but. They were not straight. They actually we look at them and be like, oh, really? So the only way for you not to be maybe a bad child, you have to be beaten up. And mm. for them, conversation was disrespectful. So you find that there's no day your parents sat you down to ask you for your opinion. Mm. Because, I mean, but also when you look at it psychologically, it's ego, power play. Yeah. For me, for you, for me to feel powerful, especially for our mothers, because they didn't have a say most of the time, you know, in mm. the society. Mm. What's the only way for her to feel powerful is I say this and this and this. So they're giving us instructions. So yeah. your opinion doesn't matter. So mm. you become a lesser human being. So at times it's more what you'd call generational trauma yes. because of where they're coming from. Yes. And they have to pass it now down. But then I think maybe because of experiences, how they parent, and then they have learned with you. Mm. And then they figured out just because you were beating her up, Probably yeah. didn't just start yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to, so Tell me more work. about generational trauma because I have a theory. I have a theory, and I don't. Okay. Know, and again, this is why we invite experts okay. so that they can validate or invalidate what these things that mm. we are saying. Okay. I have a theory. Most of us, I'd assume, most of us were born in the eighties and nineties. Um, our parents came from the seventies, sixties, and seventies. Flower babies. You remember mm. that time when? Because if you see most of the our parents like older if you have like parents who have older siblings mm -hmm. they their photos they're wearing minis they have mm -hmm. afros mm -hmm. they they look mm -hmm. so happy yeah so during that period my theory is that during that period it was like a a flower wild you know time yeah. where carefree, carefree yeah. and then AIDS hit mm -hmm. yes. and so now these our parents born in the 60s and the 70s to parent us in the 80s and 90s went through a pandemic. They went through the AIDS epidemic and where everything was like, you know, just say no, abstinence. And that's how they grew up. Because I'm assuming the kids who are born in the pandemic right now, mm -hmm. um, during that period where we were like, you can't touch this, can't you can't touch, touch that. Yeah. There has to be some sort of trauma that these kids will, mm -hmm. maybe not, but like mm -hmm. there has to be some sort of something 
that will come out of it. And I, and they say us millennials have gone through AIDS, have gone through oh, uh, COVID, have gone through what throughout mm. the years, and we can't be okay. Yeah, so me, my theory is our parents can't be okay because they went through they yeah. went through that that whole stigma. Stigma of AIDS. I remember when I was younger. We used to shun people. Like our mm. parents would be like, "Usi ongele shi uyo akona AIDS. Usi kunyo ina yoki kombe ikona AIDS. You know, mm. ule akona AIDS. It was such a big thing for them. But because you are young, you don't understand any of it. None of us young people had AIDS. So for mm. us, it wasn't a reality. But for them, it was. So I think they carried that. And that's my theory. I could be wrong. Because my grandparents, in, a, in as much as they were strict, there were things that my mother carried with her some sort of trauma and i don't know if you can call it generational from her parents or also contextually or by or environmentally i don't know mm. what you'd call that that they carried to us because i feel like we are less we we don't parent the way our parents do right. mm. yeah. is that a good thing or a bad thing i feel like for me it's a good thing um, i don't know I think it's a, it's it can be both. It can be both a good and a bad thing yeah. that we don't parent the same way our parents parented, because I mean, really, the beatings we endured. And it was like your parents are trying to kill you every <laughs> every day. It's like I didn't manage yesterday, so I'm gonna try again today. <laughs> I'm like, I it was tiring being beaten. Okay. But then also the the negative is that then we go to the other extreme where we gentle parents too gentle. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That the the child does not have a concept of no and boundaries and um, respecting um, people spaces. You know how you get, a child can visit you and you look at them and you're like, God, this one was mine. Mm. But the mother is just baby, daddy, don't, but don't, don't do that, daddy. If you're like, I no, no, no. Also, that becomes a different kind of problem. Yeah. Mm. yeah. My question would be, mm-hmm. now, other than, you know, when you look at it as an individual, I turned out okay because I was beaten up. When you look at your peers, do you think they turned out okay? Um, In the dating scene at the workplace, do you think most people turned out okay? No, I don't think we are okay. I don't think we are okay. I also don't think we are okay. We don't think we are okay. Honestly, yeah, something... we are not fine. We are yeah. not fine. So yeah. it means the beating didn't work. When you yeah. look at people who are going in for, you know, therapy boundaries, mm. lack of boundaries, I don't know, my partner at the workplace, the boss is shouting, it is he. Us who are beaten up, who is being disrespectful? Us who are beaten up. Yeah. So ideally, it what it did, I think it shamed us. It did there is something mm. called the culture of shame, mm. yeah. blame, game, mm. guilt, mm. and the whole cycle. Mm. What it did is just put us in a box. Yeah. We did. We became fearful of doing things. Necessary doesn't mm. mean if we're given the opportunity, we can't do it. So you find that now because nobody is there to beat these adults. Oh okay. my God! Yeah, they are beating each other. They are rude to each other. Because at times you'll find adults they are bullying each other even in the office mm. places and even at home. So you're saying these these people who are not beaten up are us no. in the work? Or, or no. you're saying us? We were beaten up, but yeah. what are we doing as adults? Like we domestic are... violence. Oh, oh so that's what you mean. Okay. Yeah, we become, we everything. I think we're a very violent generation. Yes. Um, simply because we were brought up in violence. Um, I also think what, what happened with us is that our parents, in many instances, weren't parented. Why? Because mm-hmm. the fight for independence happened when a lot of them were young. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of their parents were taken away. Um, they were brought up by their siblings. They watched their parents being beaten up by um, the colonialists. So that violence cycle has just kept going. So we, we've come up being very violent. We were beaten. Violence was a solution for everything. Yeah. Which is what I think a lot of us have carried forward. So we respond with violence to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And isn't that what generational trauma is? Or what is the definition? It is because we're passing on. But something mm-hmm. else now I've noticed over time, when you look at our parents, when you look at their parents, they lived in an era we call survival mode. Mm-hmm. These people have survived. If, if you mm-hmm. like to learn, most people, well, most people retiring, 
and starting new careers. Mm. These people grew up being told that a woman can't be, a woman can be, one, two, three. These people, you never had an opinion of what you like. You know, for the longest time, I thought my favorite color is blue. Mm. Simply because my mom loved blue. And mm. everything she ever got me was blue. Was blue. Mm. So ideally, as an adult, when I got to pick my own taste, I've never gotten myself anything that's blue. I would never actually think I want anything that's blue. Yeah. Mm. So you find that, I think the generations have been on survival mode. So when it comes to maybe independence, these people didn't, you know, absent parenting, mm. the society, etc. And now they have. Then, then again, in the era whereby most women now who would call our mothers got into the era where independence, women empowerment. Mm. So you're talking about women empowerment, and let's pick up on that because mm. I wanted to. I had. I had. Um, I read while I was doing my research about how do we talk about black tax and how we talk about you know. Uh, firstborn daughters and does that also come into the workplace you you mentioned like w- w- talking about what it looks like in the workplace and i read about this black superwoman syndrome which is a phenomenon of black women constantly pushing themselves to do it all for everyone at their own expense and this behavior is often learned at a young age from fam- female authority figures so you have an i don't know uh, alpha woman matriarch who does it all in the home but then you take that behavior because you saw your mom doing it you yourself you go back into the workplace and you're like and and also because we can't say Mm. no i don't know if it's everyone but millennials millennials find it so hard to say no Mm -hmm. to extra work doing things staying on in the office you always want to push yourself Mm -hmm. um this behavior is often learned at a young age from female authority figures in the family such as mothers grandmothers or aunts Black girls who are exposed to this behavior often replicate it in adulthood because they don't want to disappoint others and struggle with feelings of guilt when they say no. Okay. So that goes back to women empowerment. Mm. So the thing about, I was saying women empowerment, our parents grew up in the part where it was, you know, they grew up seeing their parents, their mothers abused most of the time, or their aunts or grandmas, because one, this woman never worked, she didn't have money, her role was domestic or trying to bring up ATC. Mm. And even if they did, there was a sense of the man says you have to respect your husband or you have to respect your grandparent or whatever that is. So most women really got to a point I have to work hard so that just in case this person tries to hit me, I have my money, I can run away. Yeah. What does that now go back to the daughter? It's like, you know what? A woman needs her own money. A woman needs one, two, three. And now we grow up saying either directly or indirectly learning that. You know, my mom is able to do this and this because she has her own money. My mom, even if my, you know, whoever is in the around us, even if we were abandoned as kids, you know, my mom managed because she could, she had a yeah. job. Mm. So it goes down and down. Then also goes back to what you were talking about, HIV and AIDS. Mm. So we've grown up as women, you grow up again with the fear of a man can do this to you or one, two, three, and you know, you can get HIV and AIDS and I've never had a conversation where men were told you can get HIV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's more of the woman, woman, woman. So what the woman does is she's learning to stand up for herself. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, women empowerment went ahead and went ahead. But I also think it disempowered most people at some point because we're living in a point of we have to prove ourselves. We're fighting secondary battles of our parents that yeah. who abused you? Nobody, but mm-hmm. you live in whatever get abused. Yeah. Uh, who, you know, did something bad to you and you were told something bad is going to happen if you don't get money. It's good for a woman to, you know, to stand her ground and have one, two, three. But most of the time, you find most people have lived out of other people's experiences. So you've seen a woman doing one, two, three there and you're like, I want to be her. Mm-hmm. Why did she become that way? Why she? We don't get to know the background story. So for us, most of the time, we are rushing to be something like oh i see you look good i mm. want to have all this but i don't know why you ended up like this yeah. so mm. for me i want to be a part like you mm. but then again you see you're fighting your battles so when i pick you i pick in your battles and it is so that then goes and becomes a cycle so mm. then then again it's something now especially for the black woman though it's universal we lack being feminine most women don't know how to be feminine in the African context. Mm. We don't even know how to ask for help. Why? Because if I ask for help, and interestingly enough, we were having a, this conversation this week with my cousin. He's telling me, I don't know how to ask for help. And even if you ask for help, you end up over explaining. Mm. You see, like, justifying why you need one, two, three. But, you know, it's, you know women were meant to sit back, relax. <laughs> 
it's so good. Well, not we, the African well, we woman. No, I don't no, know. That's why we get it wrong. Wrong. No, The African no, woman no, has no. never been told to sit back and relax. <laughs> well, no, no, that's that's actually the other mm. And if you get rest, because I remember even on a personal experience, I'm self-employed, mm. but I think maybe until a month ago, I think even secretly my mom is looking for jobs for me mm. because I'm not employed. Right. Yeah. And they feel like you have to work, work, work. If you don't work, there's a panic. Mm. If you're not maybe doing the eight to five, looking at one, like, you know, one to three, mm. if you're not getting out of the house early in the morning, looking in a certain way, dressing up in a certain yeah. way. Mm. But that's not my trauma. It's your trauma mm. because in your era, if you didn't wake up in the morning to go to work and your husband decided or whoever left you your kids were going to start. Mm, but it's yeah. a different generation. Yeah. Mm. People are working online. People mm. are doing different things. And that thing of being told you have to wake up early because that's the only way to get to... to the early but it catches, it catches the, the warm. warm. It's the only path to success. I'm like, crying out loud, no, why do I have to wake up day. at 5 a.m. all the time? My grandmother used to, used to never like to see someone sitting. Sitting, yeah. Because she'd be like, why are you sitting? Mm. There are other so many things that you can do. Mm. So actually when I thought about it and... I'm, I come from, my, I told you I'm a, I'm a feminist, mm-hmm. and, I be, and one of the principles of feminism is rest mm-hmm. is political. For us, rest is political. It has to be embedded in everything that we do. Mm-hmm. So I was talking about mm-hmm. rest being political and being embedded into every facet of what we do. The challenge here, and I think I want us to address that, and we have been talking about that. Mm-hmm. The reason why I keep saying African is because we come from a culture that is beyond, you know, we have our own different cultures. Mm. Um, And then on top of that, we have religion. So as African women, we have different cultural norms and traditions and, you know, religious that affect what we can and can and can't do as women. So even when we talk about rest, even if we go and talk about, you know, mom, this is how I'm going to gentle parent my kids now. Mm. I'm not going to beat them. I'm going to do this. Someone, when you go to Shags and just, you know, because maybe you have an international audience, <laughs> God willing, um, Shags is like basically what going uh, back uh, to uh, the country, country going mm-hmm. back to your rural yeah. areas from the city to the rural areas to visit relatives who are still there. Um, that looks different. So I want us to explore what culture looks like when you talk about let's talk about black tax Mm -hmm. (laughs) and let's talk about uh, generational trauma. What does that look like in terms of culture and, you know, norms? And uh, let me just ask the question properly. Mm -hmm. You know, how do cultural norms and gender expectations, um, you know, go around decision-making, caregiving, the burden of black tax for you as an African Mm -hmm. firstborn daughter? Culturally. Because you're the firstborn daughter, you're expected to take care of the other children. Like, mm. I, I used to take deputy mom with, um, with a certain level of pride, but then it always, always used to feel like a burden. Mm. And I, I, for the longest time, I didn't understand why. Uh, but it's because I grew up parenting my siblings. It was when my mom went to work, you were left with, this must be done, this must be done, this must be done. Mm. And then when she comes home, it will be, why have the children not eaten? Why have the children not showered? Why have the children not done this? And you don't realize it until much later. But so who are you? Because if, if your mother is asking you about the children, yeah. where, where, where does that leave you as a firstborn daughter? Yeah. And um, uh, you start asking, at some point, you'll start asking yourself, so am I not a child and am I not your child? Mm. But culturally, you were the firstborn daughter, you were expected to step in when your mother is not there. Mm. And it's, um, the, you can't question that. It's culturally, it's an expectation that you become the deputy mom. So tell us what that looks like. When you're saying, when your mom is away, mm-hmm. Um, does this mean that she so she's gone to work? She's gone to work. You've gone to school, or, obviously. Yes. Or, so what happens? Or even like um, she's gone to work and it's holiday time. Mm-hmm. So as a child, what do you want to do? You want to go out and play. Because mm-hmm. remember back then we never used to have TV. Mm-hmm. TV used to start at 5 p.m. So <laughs> yeah, the outside is your playground. It's your everything. But you're the firstborn daughter. 
The clothes need to be washed. The house needs to be cleaned. There's dishes to be done. The children need to be fed. Mm. So in the middle of your play, the back of your mind, you can't quite play as a child because you have to remember the children need to be fed, the children need to be cleaned, homework needs to be done. Yeah. And if she comes home and finds these things undone, mm. it is you. It's not the collective. Mm. I think there's, there were, there's four of us. Mm. So we grew up four, four, do, four girls, mm. yeah? But I'm the first one. So it's not all of us, it's you. It's a the first one daughter. Will the beating will be just you first. Yeah. She doesn't want to know that, no, when she left, she, she said, this one does the dishes, this one, uh, it's you. Why aren't the dishes done? Why are so the children not sense, fed? Since you are a child, child dinner project manager. Completely. Yeah. All, all my life. It's Director of operations. Of operations. Okay. And, and <laughs> so in some instances, in fact, my siblings will say they, it's easier for you to tell my to tell on them to my mother than to tell on them to me. They're, as in, they're more afraid of me than they are, even of their parents. Interesting. And then you're like, when it hits you, you're like, but wait, wait, something is wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. Because entire child as well. And so why am I parenting the other children? Interesting. So what, how does that, what does it look like mm -hmm. as a grown-up? Because when we start talking, we have been mm -hmm. saying black cat. What does that definition look like for you as a grown-up? As a grown-up? For me, it's that I always have to know where everybody is. I have to know how, how everybody is. Um, and my mother will most likely call me to ask me, have you spoken to so-and-so? Are they okay? Are they? And then sometimes um, it, it wears you down mm. because you're constantly uh, parenting other people. Mm. And you kind of feel like there's no space, there's nowhere for you to go for parenting. Yeah. Um, and and then now you also have your own children. So you're like, am I going to carry these ones? Am I mm. carrying these ones first? Who, which ones am I parenting first? And and when where is that? Is there even a line? There's no line. Yeah. It's you're constantly being a parent. And you're still and you expected have no, to be a wife. And, and you're still expected to be a, a wife and be a daughter and then and go to work yeah. and um, perform. That sounds so it's, exhausting. It's, it's, it is exhausting. It is exhausting and um. I think, especially for our generation, um, we're getting to the point where we're starting to learn how to say no. I was even having a conversation with a friend of mine who is, a f but he's a firstborn son. Mm. Black tax is sitting on his head so much. He was like, I can't do this anymore, but these people won't even listen. Yeah. I have no space to, um, to express what I'm, I'm feeling, what I'm going through. I have so much expectation on my back, but they keep forgetting um, I, have a ch I have children of my own. Mm. And then because we, un we were not allowed to question it, when you say no, then on top of that, you now have to deal with the guilt. First you're guilt tripped, and then you have to live with the guilt, self guilt, because mm. you, it now becomes, it now feels like you're failing. Yeah. And you're doing the wrong thing. But in essence, you're doing the right thing. It's just there's you a, are not allowed. There's a, so I've had this personal conversation mm. a lot, a lot with different people to the point that now I've started asking different people, what is your experience as a firstborn, mm. as a second middle child, yeah. as, a thir as a last, last born. born? And the, so for me, the day this hit home for me, and maybe you can... You can you can let me know if I'm crazy or not. So my not <laughs> please 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 do because then you'd be like no that's not right. So I'm a firstborn. Uh, there's a big difference between me and my siblings. Like this like a ten year nine year gap. Mm. So I usually say to people that I've gone through stages of what so I've been a, I was an only child, child for a really for long, long time. time yeah. And then other kids came. Um, for me, it was a bit different because I didn't to want to parent those other children. Mm. And then as I grew up, uh, because I I tell people that I kind of grew up with my parents. Mm. And what that looked like was my mom was young. The way you're saying, I was an experimental child. So mm. she was mothering me as she was learning how to mother. How to mother. Yeah. And that looked different. Every stage 
because you know as a child you're different as a toddler you're different mm-hmm. as a teenager you're different and it was like i was their experiment and it, and it i could see it much later because we had a fraught relationship with my mother until i was much older mm-hmm. and that was because we i think we are too similar so like you said i saw my mother doing everything and so i wanted to be that mm-hmm. i wanted to be that black superwoman mm-hmm whatever syndrome that you have. Mm. And then as I grew older, I realized that I I I become a project manager. So mm. someone told me the other day, actually it was Kibali, it was like, the way you move, um, because you're so used to black tax, when someone calls, you don't even want to hear. You're a mm. problem solver. You don't mm. even want to hear. So I know you want money. That's That's what's in your head. Yeah. Or or whatever it is, I can solve your problem mm. before you even tell me what it is. Yeah. Hello, hi, how are you? Oh, you know, Nini, nini. have you gone to the hospital? Mm. What have did the doctor done? say? Have did you, you do this? Did you do that? And so I was telling my friend the other day, I have to learn how to be empathetic mm. and and ask the question: Would you like me to provide you a solution, or would you just want me to listen? So for me, that's mm. something I'm learning now because I, the first thing that comes into my brain is. Hospital. <laughs> what did the doctor say? Mm. Did you, uh, or you call me and be like, eh, yesterday my boyfriend said, I'm like, have you, did you go to the therapist? Mm. Did you do that? That's the first thing that goes into my brain. Now, my husband is a last born and they have older, he has older siblings. So he told me something one day and he was like, the same thing that I've just told mm. you. That sounds exhausting. Mm. That's what he told me. Mm. And he said, by the time some, something, and I hope you won't kill me for saying this, but by the time something trickles down for him to problem solve, there are other people, are other who, have people who have been consulted. Yeah. He won't be the first. Mm. By, by the time by the he's time been consulted gets... first, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah. So it hit me that day. It was a couple of years ago. Mm. And I was like, what? What do you mean? You don't the... get the first phone mm. call for, oh, so such a And I'm like, What? For me, it's sasa to do, and I've already, mm. I already have you, you, five you, things before yeah. you even pick up the phone, and I'm like, umeenda kwa garage, umepeleka uyu, mm. umefanya nini? And if it's not someone who will just basically say, stop, listen to my problem first, mm. which is what Kibali was telling me last mm. week. He was like, you have to learn to just first hear, and, and for him, he also, so we discussed this also last week, and he said, mm. Because he deals with someone like me as a firstborn, mm. he's learned to present quickly, present the problem and solutions. Mm. Because because <laughs> it beca- it becomes automatic when the when they call you, there's a problem. You best have a solution. The worst the worst case scenario we did have. I'm a firstborn, but mm-hmm. I don't have solutions actually. No, so no, he's, go- he's him. He's not a firstborn. Yeah. He's saying because mm. he's used to dealing with with firstborns, with firstborns mm. who already have. Pro- like he's already trying to problem solve before you even tell them yeah. mm. the problem. So secondary, you pick it up. Yes. Yeah, mm. So the the second it person, your pers- it but, becomes your problem automatically. Yeah, so she's like, yeah. a, so he's like, because I know you're going to try and problem solve this problem. I don't want to give you more stress. Mm. It's gotten to a point where now I just call you and tell you there's a problem, but I found two solutions for this. So mm. calm down. Mm. And it 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 takes getting used, used to to, yeah. to dealing with people like mm. that. So for me, I usually feel like there's levels of how to look at and deal with people. I don't know if you've gone mm, yeah. through that me as well. Me and my friend were discussing that and she was making fun of me. She was telling me, the only reason you're a therapist, it's because you like offering solutions. <laughs> this thing got into you so much. <laughs> so much you became a, a therapist. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> very important. Because she's like, we were discussing survival mode and mm. what's, how do you, you know, living in survival mode, levels of friendship, how do you differentiate, when to even, you know, just come in for somebody and when to say no. Lately I've learned, uh, I got to a point a few a couple of years ago, I was just like, you can ask me for a solution, I have it, and I just say no. So confidently and smiling, mm. and I'm like, what have you tried out? Or what do you think? How would you want? But then again, something else, I want to just maybe take it back to mm. whatever she was talking about. First one struggled more with decision-making fatigue. You know, everybody yeah, expects you to, to make have, decisions, to, have, to yes. have the answers. And, and it's actually, I think, until it happened to me, because mm. I could find myself making, and now the 
worst case scenario be a firstborn be the firstborn cousin so that means you have your aunts and uncles depending on you mm. have a case whereby maybe you're supposed to care give for somebody else as well mm. you're like everybody's calling you do this fix this do this it does some point i'm just like slow down people what's the worst somebody told me these people won't die do you know this people won't yeah you know? yeah. yeah and i'm just like oh i need to sit myself with my education go back and remind myself what do you tell people every day for living mm. you know take care of yourself making fatigue, fatigue is yes. such a good it's i real. don't even know mm. it's real it's for me i know i can't make more than certain decisions in a day i actually count I can't wow. make. I actually even pick right. Like, mm. I pick like, like that session. Like how? <laughs> like like, like, no, like right goals. now, as I'm sitting, I'm wondering mm. if I'm looking at the time. I'm thinking, hey, I'm a katamaru, I'm a mm. Like no. those are the things I mean, that you have to stop. Mm. You know, I've learned it my way. Like I actually decide today I've made enough decisions. Let's pick it up tomorrow. Mm. And I had to learn because I also learned because of my work. I'm also helping other people, so I have to put my boundaries. So I can only help like I can do more than four sessions a day. Why? Why can I so more than I mean, mm. no, it's not gonna happen to, to me. So, but this is something people then also black tax is not only financially, it's mentally, mentally. it's emotionally. Mm. What happens to the kids whereby you had it all, you had a nanny, uh, the basics were taken care of, mm. but your parents are going to separation, divorce, you have maybe a terminally ill child. What happens in that case? You have to ensure, you know, even the basic things whereby you have a toddler in the house mm. and you're like, watch that kid, mm. make sure they don't fall. You know, you put on the weight of another life as a child. Make sure they don't swallow something. Go play with them. Be mindful. They don't jump. They don't fall mm. down. You, ideally, a parent has given you their, their life of a mm. child to go take care of it. What does that even position you in life? So you grow up thinking like, this is my responsibility. Everything, if I mess up this up, this is it. Oh my a, God. Yeah. Mm. This is why we have... <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't know that's an actual thing. It mm. is, because most of the time we grow up like this being held over your shoulders. Mm. So you also find that now when it comes to past ones, there's, there's a lot of disempowerment. And that's what people are struggling mm. with. You move around. I do something called identity self. Yes, my hello self. It's actually called hello self. Wherever we do identity, try and learn yourself. Yes, hello mm. self. Yeah. Mm. It's a whole program where you get to learn. Say hi to yourself. Mm. Like, learning, relax. Mm. Yeah. Meet you yeah. first for mm. the first time. Yeah. And most of my clients are first ones. So for hello self, most I learned most of my clients are first ones. Simply because you know <laughs> simply because I don't know, I came sat down. Thank God I feel like maybe I had the luxury of a parent who maybe she even loves to date and told me I should have become a psychologist for her. My mother did a very, very good job. Little I learned I was protected from a lot, a lot, a lot. And I'm able to understand who I am, what don't I like, etc. But you come to learn this first one crew I've been told. Where's it funny? Maybe because, you know, the siblings are looking mm, over you. You yeah. can do this. You have to do this. You never sat down and anybody asked you, hey, what would you want to become? Mm. You may have to become a doctor, a lawyer for a family. Yeah. If you go become a DJ, mm. what would our... Oh, and that thing of being an example. Exactly. I, I remember think... once my parents, I, was, I don't know what had happened. It was probably something that I'd done. Well, because of having so many boxes and... So many do not. It just got to a point I became a rebel. I was like, ah, because everything is a do not. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to do it. See, I'm going to be punished anyway. Let me enjoy it to the max. So one day I was beaten. And um, I remember my mother saying I needed to be an example. And I'd gotten so tired of being the example. The example. I'm like, hey, hey, please, can let somebody, somebody else be the me. example. So I, I, was, I was probably... 13 or 14, no, wow. or, or, yeah, somewhere in my teens. Yeah. So I've been beaten, I've been told I, I need to be an example to the others. I was so frustrated and tired at that point. I remember turning around and told my, my siblings, listen, I am nobody's example. Mm. I don't want to be anybody's example. Don't look at me, don't be like me, don't, I'm not being, I'm tired, yeah. I'm done. Yeah find somebody else to be an example. And my mother was so furious. <laughs> I was beaten <laughs> some more. more. I was, but it was tiring. I'm like, why do I have to be the one who has to be an example? Why can't I just be me? Yeah. Why do I have to be the perfect one so that everybody else knows what perfection looks like? And at that point, I'm like, I'm tired. Hey, this being perfect is, I think, is too much. I think I actually understand what you're saying because mm. I feel for me, and I don't even know if it was... If it, and, I, and I usually, maybe I need to come for that course of yours. Mm -hmm. I usually say for me, 
the break came when my mother I stopped being a, an only child and she, she then got married mm. and had other children. She had another project. Yes, <laughs> like other than me. Mm. But it's not like, it because we were, I say this all the time, I grew up in my grandparents' house. Mm-hmm. And my grandparents treated me mm. like a princess. Mm. They're like, I had a good mm. upbringing. I was like the last born of that entire house. So I was like, you know, the, mm. the, last, the last born. Mm-hmm. And then only child of my mother. And then I moved from that to husband and kids new kids and then all of a sudden it's oh mtoto, oh do this mm. for the kids and i literally i i couldn't i couldn't like for me and like you mm. i completely refused to parent these mm. other kids i was just like that's your this. problem that's those are mm. your kids i didn't ask for them i'm like z i'm not going to do it now nah, question how did how has did it affect your relationship to have with your siblings e, yes it did because i i I mean, it was, it's fraught. It's, mm-hmm. it's not, I wouldn't say like it was like a very, oh, these are my, these are my siblings. So when we grew older and so now we started having mm-hmm. some sort of relationship. So like I kind of got out of it. Being problem solver has always been how I view myself in terms of, and it's always been, how do I solve this problem financially? How mm-hmm. do I, f- for me, it's like, come on, you can always do it. Well. And mm-hmm. Throwing money at the problem has never solved the situation. It always mm. makes it worse. worse. And so I was going to explain about what I think parentification is. Mm-hmm. And it's literally what you said about deputy mom. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you can tell us more about hello self and what that looks like. And then you are going to ask me a question about what is my, how is my relationship with my siblings. Yeah. So before I answer that question, I'm going to just read um, what parentification is. Parentification is a phenomenon in which a child is forced to take on adult roles and responsibilities, typically beyond their age and developmental stage within their family. This can occur when a child is expected to fulfill caregiving, emotional or practical roles that are traditionally associated with parents or Mm -hmm. adult figures. And this can happen in various ways, such as when a child is required to take care of younger siblings, manage household chores, provide emotional support to family members, or assist with financial responsibility. Mm. So, does that sound familiar? Sounds like my life. Sounds like my life as well. <laughs> it sounds like so, it's, it's so what yeah, my life so looks like. That's where we are mm, okay, on this yeah. side. Mm, yeah, I'm about to say, I'm sorry that happened to you. <laughs> it was not your fault. <laughs> but you can work through it. Mm-hmm. So ideally, the whole past, that's what parentification is. You ideally picked up the roles of parents, be it emotionally. And most of the, I was insisting on the emotional part because people tend to forget the emotional, mm. you know, givers of their, you know, people. Mm. Parentification is also, in a way, being a spouse to your parent. Well, by your parent comes and tells you, your mother did, your father did, one, two, three, mm. happened. You see that whole, and in the African setup, people think it's normal. Uh, and maybe when your parents are having rivalry, then you have to take side. Go tell your mother to do this. Mm. Go tell your father to do this. And then you're just a child. So you have to step up to be the communication person in between that yeah. house. Mm. And that <laughs> one does, Imagine. And that mostly happens for the first ones because then again, you don't want the marriage to break up. You feel it's like your fault. You don't want these relationships to do one, two, three. So at times you find yourself, you giving in to a lot and you try to find solutions of things that are not supposed to be, mm. you know, to be your fault. Then also now that goes back to the question I was asking you about, you know, your siblings relationship. You find that most first ones have a strenuous relationship with the first one. It could happen both ways, whereby you find the first one because you're educated now the parents feel like it's you and most people took up the first ones as projects mm. so you you were taught brought up to pick up the role of the parent this means that study hard get a career go to school kindly make sure mm. they go back to school yeah. and then that also builds up these younger kids who are just kids per se know that you had it all that's the reason we don't have it at mm. all yeah. mm. so that means it's your responsibility to pour into us because yeah. they poured into you until it was over mm. which necessary it's not supposed to be the case mm. then there's now the dynamics of the other side of the coin where the first one is parentified they missed out on opportunities so what does that build up mm. resentment towards now the mm. younger kids so yeah. it's not them looking up to them and being like you had it all it's the first one feeling like 
I couldn't study better. Why? Because I had to take care of you. I couldn't move, uh, get another job. What if I got that job? What would it mean? Mm. And I remember, is it Kitali or you were speaking to? And there was that conversation about even some have to hold on their marriages. You know, I can't. If I bring in a family right now, my spouse or my partner might not be supportive of me educating you people. Mm. So that means we've had people who have. And I remember my partner actually told me this. I respect our firstborn, though their firstborn is a son. He actually held his marriage to educators and teachers you know so that shows oh. the extent okay <laughs> he, he married later on in life to oh. ensure so we went, you went to, to school yes yeah. what is that imagine it's so it's nice. you know i was speaking to my partner and i realized even things like um your sibling needing a roof over their head as a firstborn it's i mean it's automatic you Somewhere to stay. Yeah. I'll move for you. Mm-hmm. Come in and stay. My partner is like, mm-hmm. I don't live with people. I'm like, it's not people. It's your sibling. It's like nobody. Mm-hmm. But well, mm-hmm. I, unlike me who's at the top of the food chain, he's at the bottom. He's the second last one. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, by the time anybody me. needs to, to be housed, there's a whole line of other people who have yeah. been asked. But I'm at, being at the top, you're the first person that they ask. So you'll be like, um, we need, it becomes your problem. Mm. This has happened, it becomes your problem. So it's, um, it's like for me, it's, I've had to go through therapy to realize I, 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 I had been parentified mm. all my life. Um, and yet I have other siblings. So like people, it's, it's, almost unheard of that somebody will call my second born sister with a problem. It's Tevarita first, then if it needs to be um, escalated downwards, then I will do that. So and they will not, it, it's even, um, we had a situation and my, one of my friends stepped in and when she asked my, one of my sisters, so why aren't you asking your other sister? She was like, I shall say no. <laughs> my friend came and she no. was like, you see, I keep telling you. <laughs> Yes. You need to learn how to say no. Yeah. Nobody's going to go and ask her because they know. So why are we afraid to say no? Why, why? Because, because we, we we've never them. been we've so never been given the option of saying no. Yeah, and it's not and an it's, option. Let me cut it short. Mm, okay. It's not an option. Mm, you see, the way of saying first ones have been discredited a lot because mm, you had to be an example. Then you've been also disempowered. You were taught, and you were never told mm, you can do this. You were told you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. You're yeah. not good enough. You have to mm, be good enough. So you felt that what first ones, most first ones did, they ended up people pleasing. Yes. So for you, you knew the only way to get affection in this community, everybody seems to have it out. Mm-hmm. So what you do, you have to, dis- you, it's actually a coping mechanism, you fall. Mm-hmm. So you, people who are treating you badly have to be nice to them because it's been told a lot of times you're not good enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the only, subconsciously you know you're not good enough. So when you're doing something, you have to double check. Mm-hmm. You have to ensure this person likes you. So you've learned the only way you make your parents happy is when you say yes. And, and as a you child, do you want to make them happy. Yeah. You yeah. want your siblings happy. Mm. You want the love and affection. Mm. So what does, then you know the friend doesn't know now you're no longer a child. Mm. Now you're into adulthood. Mm. So you find yourself, every time you've learned, your brain mastered. How do I get to be accepted? Yes. How do I get the love and affection? Yes. People yeah, pleasing. they're saying they're people pleasers. No, so, okay, it doesn't have to be a first, first one. People who can, they don't have boundaries to say no. Mm. Are people pleasers because they were parentified in a way. The only way they got affection, they have learned subconsciously. Yeah. Mm. You know, I have to give up my rights. I have to break my rules mm. for me to feel acceptable. Yeah. Nobody's to be, validating to be acceptable. In life. Mm. The only time you're validated in life is when you do something or when you say yes. So it becomes a habit. Wherever you go, even you can tell your boss, no, it won't mm. take much work or an excuse because mm. you're like, no, I want to belong. And you find that most of the time they are looking for a connection, a sense of belonging. Yeah. Mm. So the only way to get that, if you say yes and you get it subconsciously, that's all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's um I, I actually agree with you. It's that thing of because you were at the top, you your af- affection for you came for for the first one came with conditions. You had to be good enough, you had to have good grades, you had to do the right things. And when you didn't do those things, you were a bad child. Mm-hmm. Um I my friend used to, my best friend has for long Longest time ever. She was, and she's the last one. She's like, you are such a people pleaser. And I'd look at her, I'm like, what the hell are you even talking mm. about? But going to therapy 
has shown me, I mean, it's true. Um, it's very hard for me to say no, because I'm like, if I say no, then she's going to think I'm not good enough and she won't like me anymore. So I don't have the space. I don't have the capacity to take on whatever you're asking me for. Yeah. But saying no is... I think that's unhappy. on top of being a people mm. pleaser, which me, I think I'm not. I don't, I, I say no a lot. Mm. Um, and this was even before therapy. But um, I find it hard to say. So it's usually no with a caveat. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you, you can't just say, yeah, you justify. Mm. Yeah. You know, you'll just be like, I don't have money right now, you know, because mm. I had to go pay this, mm. I had to do that, but you just it, it can't, can't be say, just no. I don't have money. Exactly. Or so, I, I'm not able yeah. to do it. It's but good. then again, how did you grow up? Mm. You account. You know, I actually figured out this last week. There's a difference between how I explain and how I deal with it. Mm. So for me, I don't explain it even on a personal level. I'm like, this is how I spent this one day. Mm. Then now I'm doing a project with somebody and they're like you need money for the project. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why are you telling me all these stories? Yes, we already spoke about this. Why do you have to get back in? And I thought, I've done other projects and I thought I was told accountability. When you come mm -hmm. in, this is how we spent this money. It's yeah. not here and yeah. it's not here. But then when I sat down, I was like, oh, even in the years of therapy and doing this whole thing, you still find <laughs> you yourself. You still find yourself. Because even me, accountability is very, very important mm -hmm. for me. Like I usually find that, especially when you give me money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this comes from, you know, being beaten being when you're, beaten when you're when sent, you to, the sent shop. to the shop. Yeah. When you give me money that's not mine, mm -hmm. I will make sure that I count for it mm -hmm. every single cent, I especially know. when I know it's not mine. Mm -hmm. But if you give me money and say, here, spend it how you want, mm -hmm. I will spend it. Because I know you don't, you wouldn't, you're not going to ask me for how did I spend it or how do I what, exactly. whatever. I don't know if that's a trauma response. But then but, again, yours is better. There are people like would still go ahead and tell you, oh, but hey, remember the money you got? Mm. You, know, you know, the you investor, hey, I actually did went ahead and did this. This is it. But, it's because but who will send you money? Me, no one sends me money. Oh, I'm who sorry. sends me no. money? You're like, I'm please, sorry. I wish somebody could <laughs> send me money. Send you money. Your friends <laughs> no one sends me money. <laughs> send your friends who understand your personal Actually, I don't know if it's the same with you. No, mm. one, no one sends me stuff. Oh. There was a day that my friend sent me some some cookies and 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 in my mind I was just like if this is not my partner if this is not who I called everyone but her mm. because in my mind I was like it can't it can't be you you're busy there's mm. things that you're doing blah 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 um, I would never assume, assume that, that you would be yeah. in a position to send me stuff mm. and yeah so I no one sends me stuff no one sends me money. I think so, you need to be intentional with your friendships. <laughs> you you need to find more last bonds. Because all friendship. of us are past bonds. You're like, oh, yeah. you have no, so many things that are going mm. with my circles. And we've gotten to the position whereby we speak. They don't talk to me about their issues with us. Just because I'm a therapist, I'm not a therapist. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so mm. we've gotten to a point whereby we can sit down and ask, do you have a position? Can you take me in? Can you listen to me? So mm. that's a yes or a no. Mm. So I can say no or yes. But I think, again, we were not taught how to be intentional. We didn't have the luxury of choice. Mm. So I think that's still something else we can do when growing up. I've learned to do it for myself. Mm. So you need people who can just randomly wake up and do things for you. Necessarily, they don't have to be last no, words. Now that I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. also that's a form of self-care, by the way. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel validated, nice about yourself. Because you can't be, I've learned, you can't be the giver. You need somebody, and I say most of the time, get three, and I think there's more even now necessary for first ones, mm. get three levels of friendships or mm. people in your life. People above you, people who point to you. You see those people who will just do something grand for you, mm. call you, people who pick up the phone calls and call you, and you're like, how would I ever even call you? Like, it's a bit weird if I ever called you and mm. ask you how you're doing. Get people at your same level. You see now we're here and you're like, yeah, that happens to me. Mm. And now you get people who are lower than you. At least you're able to pick up and tell them, you know, Mm. This happens like this, or I did this, or you can do it but, differently. But I usually find that very difficult to move out of the circle that you know. I don't yes. know if it's the same with you, because mm. I realized another thing mm -hmm. about me, and I don't know if it's a first one thing or if, a, if it's a whatever thing, but I think it's a trauma response. Mm. I have to be in control. Oh, of whatever. It's a, and, it's yes. not, and it's not that overt. It's mm. not an overt it's, power mm -hmm. so it used to be so bad that i would walk into a room um i used to do events a long time ago mm -hmm. i'd walk into a room and i'd and i'd literally spot things that are not working right. and i'd be like oh my god this is such a bad event mm -hmm. and the entire time i'd be so upset that mm -hmm. things are not 
that light is not working properly. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, who is that? Why did that, they why put is that? Dress? Yeah, why is why it dressed like that? Why did they put that? that thing over there? They, should, they need to... And I've even found myself rearranging things at events where I'm a guest. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's not my <laughs> event. Literally. But it's so much that I, I, I can't. My therapist you asked me a simple now. question. Mm-hmm. She asked me a simple question. So I gave her an example when we were, so when we were discussing this. And I told her, my thing for wanting things to go the way I want them to go um, is very, it, it's, it's making me, you know, whatever that mm. therapy term is or psychology <laughs> term is, it's, it's what's eating me up. Exactly. Because I told her, it even presents itself in the workplace. And I gave mm. a very specific example. The team was around and, you know, someone asked me in the WhatsApp group, can you recommend places where we can go for dinner? Can you recommend places where we can do this? And for me, in my mind, it was like, you're asking me to help you organize this thing. Mm. And I'd be like, you know, that entire time I was so upset. I'm like, guys, I'm late. We're going to be late for this thing. We're going to be this. I'm asking her, did you call the place? Did you book the appointment? Mm. Did you do this? And she's like, yeah. And it, it it was making me angry. Like, and so the ther- my therapist was asking me, why were you mm. angry? Why you, why you mm. give it, was it your responsibility? No, it isn't. But it isn't. But you asked me, mm. you asked me to help, help you. you. So I'm helping. Yeah. But, but then let again, me help you how I want to, to help, help you. you. Mm. But then again, you find that now this very first one, so this empower other people and mm. they rub your relationship very mm. well. Because this person asked for help, but now you want to, it couldn't have been their shining moment. You see, mm. the moment they wanted to do something, even for you, mm. they wanted to prove to you, I can do it. Mm. But what did you do? You went all mm. out. Inside, on, guns yeah. blazing, taking over and yeah. making sure everything is done and somebody is wondering what's Correct. going on but then again maybe it's now to subconsciously remember nobody's asking you for perfection nobody's mm. asking you to take responsibility you're not supposed to parent here like now have it in the back of mind exactly mine. you're not a deputy parent here yeah. these are other adults and i'm no longer that in a, this way of now working on your inner child comes mm. in yeah because you now have to have a conversation with your inner child and be like you know what baby girl we moved past yes. this this is no longer this and actually now, can you experience the other part of having people, things go their way? Because mm. what's the worst case scenario? If the light is not okay, yeah. what will it stop anything from My, happening? Exactly. The thera- so I found a word for it. And this is why I'm saying this is important mm. to be in spaces like this. Mm-hmm. So whether or not you can afford therapy or, you know, just try and speak to someone about it or, or watch this podcast. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I have found a word for it. Um, and that's not only you're disempowering your siblings, but infantilizing them. Yeah. So you're yes. treating them like children. like they were still those same babies yeah. that you're trying to parent. Mm. So maybe when they're calling you to tell you, I don't have money for rent, they're not asking you, one, to send money. They're not yes. asking, two, for you to go and talk to the mm. landlord. They're not asking you. But you've already done those things you, already before, the event, before you yeah. even put down the phone. Mm. I'm mm. going to call your landlord and I'm going to talk to them about that. And, and maybe, maybe she just wanted to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe she just wanted to speak. Yeah. To, to have a sounding board, but hey. I think uh, I told you you're very huge in content around here. Mm-hmm. So maybe you need to, before you offer somebody else, ask them, how can I help? I also, on a personal level, I struggle with that. Like, mm. you tell me you're sick, but you don't want me to come in hospital to give, or yeah. you don't want me to come cook for you. Yeah. So yeah. how can I show you love? And mm. they're like, no, it's okay. I was just having love. But now, if I don't show up there, yeah. then what yeah. will happen? What will happen? Do? But yeah. maybe it's now more of asking you, hey, how do you need me to help? Or how can I mm. come in? Or how can I support you? Or how yeah. would you feel supported right now? Yeah. Yeah. And now also how learning is how can you feel supported? Then yeah. learning this is not about me, it's about you. You mm. know that part of whereby you're not taking up their whole mm. space and emotions. Mm. So it's like how can I support you right now? And the person can say, Just give me time, I'll figure it out. If I don't, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Then you're like, Do you want me to follow up or you get back to me? And the person is going to tell you how they would reply it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think those are those are so important. Like honestly, I feel like I've learned so much in therapy, first of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, just want to mm-hmm. say thank you to my therapist. Uh, but it's it's been about understanding those tools. And you can't do that if you're not talking to other people. Yeah. Because that thing for disempowering, and I'm glad you said it, it's it's so you don't realize you're doing it. And literally you move mm. by how you are taught. taught. Yeah. So that generation it's somebody with a problem, they mm-hmm. come to you. You best have a solution because 
If you don't, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. Or you're yeah. going to be beaten or you're going because there'll be punishment. There'll be some consequence that will affect you. Yet it has nothing to do with you. I love this. Uh, I love uh, TikTok is my new is my new jam. So I I love how these young people are and also millennials finding an opportunity to share mm. you know their stories. So there's one I was watching about you know not removing the chicken from the fridge. Okay. You know in the morning when your mother leaves and says remove the chicken from the fridge, mm. I'm going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so she's come back and it's still frozen. How is she going to start cooking and things like that? So mm. that's a chapel. And I was like it makes so much sense because. I, my mother, when she comes from work, your mother, when she comes from work, always there. What's Hello. happening? Okay. So as I was saying, when my mom comes from work, it later, now this mm. is me being an adult thinking about it. When I come from work, I'm tired, but me, I work from home. So this mm. is a different dynamic of how that looks like. But mm. she's come from work. If she's come by Matatu, if she's driven, it's taken her a long time. She's coming back to a home where she's not expecting the the man of the home to help her in the kitchen because, you know, the dynamic then was different. Mm -hmm. And then she also has kids. Or maybe she has a nanny or she doesn't have a nanny, but she's tired. So you're thinking the people who should be helping me in this house are not doing what they're supposed to do. Doing what they should be doing. So who's going to get the first first kitchapo? The one at the top of the food tray. The person I told you to remove remove the the chicken. chicken. Like honestly, mm. and and I saw it so clearly, and I was like, "You're de- you're you're being deputized completely, but you're not doing your job." Mm. And why are you not doing your job? Because you're a child. Child, and it's like all you. Wa- I keep saying, um, a lot of the times I was beaten because I forgot to remove the chicken from mm. the fridge. What was I doing? I was outside playing. Mm. I was being a have. child, yeah. but the chicken from the fridge is not part of so <laughs> i'd go out and play and really enjoy being a child then you come back home and you're like oh shit the yeah, chicken is still in the fridge yeah, another conversation Bus. whereby mm-hmm. i think our parents never understood we didn't sign up to be born and most of yes. the time when i tell people that because i'm told we've been a bit rude but i'm like no these are two Spoken. people fell in love yeah. did their own mm. thing i was just a product you know i just came by as a product and now i'm supposed to do all these things that you want me to do and take all this responsibility that I didn't sign up yeah, for, yeah. you know. And now the issue comes in when you say that to the elder generation, they get very, 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 very offended. offended. Like, yeah. why are you being disrespectful? But in reality, mm. you're supposed to be the child. You're supposed to be just being a child. Because even I was telling my younger sister like two weeks ago, I'm still my parents' child. I've refused. Yeah. Because I didn't get to experience that on a personal level, I've refused. I'm not being an adult. Yeah. Mm. So as we so as we wrap up, as we are trying to wrap up, I have two two last questions. Mm-hmm. One is do you believe this intergenerational trauma that you're carrying? You're passing it on to your children. Because I know you have generational generation. Trauma. Um I think um unfortunately, yes. Uh but it's from a lack of knowing that you have trauma. Mm. It never occurred to me that I'd been parented by a parentified until maybe like a year or two ago. Mm. It's when um, we had a situation and just couldn't take it anymore. And then I went into therapy. And in therapy, I realized that this is why. Um, and I look at my daughter, who is also a firstborn. And I'm like, is this why she wanted to go to boarding school? Because there was suddenly another child in the house. In, yeah. in the house and was I making her uh, a parent to her sibling um, and and now because I'm conscious about it it's it's something that I even have a conversation with her about um, and and we're getting to a point where we talk about it and like okay fine you are the first one but you're not responsible for your brother mm-hmm. please understand that and she's like, but he's my brother. I'm like, yes, he's your brother. Exactly, he's your brother. He's not your child. Mm. Um, and to try and fix that. And, and I'm like, it's the two of you, and I will need you to learn to watch each other's back. But remember, you're both children. I'm yeah. the mother. I'm yeah. the parent. You're not the parent of either of you. So don't 
feel that you're obligated to take to mm. sort out the mm. other person's problems. Yeah. You know, that's not yeah. your business. That's not part of what you need to be doing. You're a child. So if they have a problem, they come to me. I'm the adult. I'm the I'm the parent here. It's um I think be, by being conscious and being aware that this is what we went through and this is what we have lived through, we can break that that cycle. That cycle. So mm-hmm. first of all. La- the last word, like literally, mm-hmm. what you're going to take away from this, go to therapy. Yes, <laughs> we're all traumatized. <laughs> we, tra- we have so much trauma. <laughs> go for therapy. Yeah, go talk to someone. But because yeah. also honestly, like to disagree with something that I found. I, mm-hmm. I don't know whether this is common. It's human nature behavior. Is there anything positive we picked up from our parents? Yes. Of yes. yes. A lot of things. A lot of things. How comes we don't let those things impact us? Because I came, for, for a moment, I came to learn. There's a cycle. Mm. You see even how girlfriends go out and talk. Most of the time, we look into vent, not get solutions. Yeah. I think people should be very, you see, once you've realized there's a problem, stop talking about it. Mm. Act on it. Mm-hmm. You know. So I will, I, will, I will say something about that. Not disagreeing, but like just... Yeah, um, as a final note, just not disagreeing, but as as human mm-hmm. people or, mm-hmm. you know, people right now, mm-hmm. we have been those firstborn daughters or whatever it is that you are, you have been stifled for so long. Yeah. Therapy is not a thing that we we think of the first time when you're, mm-hmm. when you're having a traumatic, some of the experiences, we were talking about birth trauma in another episode. Mm-hmm. And... Honestly, you don't know what birth trauma is until someone comes and tells you that was a traumatic experience. Mm. And where are you going to find those people? If me and Evarita and three of us mm. are hanging out, we are going to be talking about, about the same security. things because those are our experiences. Yeah. And you're going to move with the knowledge that, okay, maybe this is how life is supposed to be. You know you're tired. You know you're exhausted. Mm-hmm. You know this is not right. Mm-hmm. But until someone else from a different worldview comes and tells you, hey, hey, that, my friend, is it's generational right. trauma. Mm-hmm. That is not okay. Mm-hmm. You need therapy. Or your therapist or someone else comes and tells you, that's not cool. And I feel like, and I keep saying it, COVID allowed us to sit and breathe and listen mm-hmm. and think. The world kind of stopped for a minute. Mm-hmm. And we were all thrown into this place together. So you will hear a lot more about that just because... We were not hanging out with the same people anymore. Yeah, now you're yeah. hanging out with your spouse. Mm. Now you're hanging out with your partner. Now you're hanging out with your kids. And you're like, I, have I traumatized this child? Mm. Such things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So just to wrap up, um, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> your expert view was very needed and very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And thank you, Varita. Mm-hmm. I mean, me and you can... <laughs> And have yeah, this, this conversation, conversation endlessly. And, and that's what yeah. Dr. Grace is saying. Don't do that. <laughs> Ask Action. yourself, how can, we, yeah. how can we move forward? forward. Okay, so we have agreed we are traumatized <laughs> and we are angry at our parents and our whoever is doing this and mm. our triggers. Yeah. But how do we make ourselves better? That's very, very important. Because mm. yeah. you find that, you find, if you don't go to the point where you're like, how can we move forward? Yeah. Tomorrow we'll be catching up on this story. So after mm. that happened, what happened? Yeah. Do you remember yeah. this story? Mm. I think we need to accept like, it's never too late. Mm. We can work on this and get out of it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. my point. Okay, so thank you. And I think we're going to call this episode where? Because that's how. <laughs> <laughs> I how sometimes it feels. In fact, I was laughing there that there's somebody me. sent me a link. Uh, and the title, I, I just burst out laughing. <laughs> the title of that article was, Are You Happy or Are You a Firstborn Child? I was like, sure. You're a firstborn daughter. So... <laughs> what can you be? Why does it you have to be, be one or the other? other. Can't you can't be both. You, you can't be it's, both. It's a reality of being a firstborn uh, daughter. Yeah. You're, so, you're either happy or you're a firstborn. But so now I learn we can be both. Yes. yes. Yeah. Hey, can mm. we? So we're still going to call it where? We can. <laughs> where? <laughs> where? <laughs> where? <laughs> you know what <laughs> happened to me yesterday. So yeah. yeah. So thank you for coming. Mm. And hopefully we're going to continue this conversation another time off off air. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.